So welcome everyone to this Meet the Candidate Town Hall hosted by APAPA, um, Asian American, Asian Pacific American Public Affairs and Idea Education Foundation. We are so honored to have uh, all of you is here today. I'm Liang Chao. I'm the Vice Mayor of Cupertino. I'm here today representing myself only. I was elected uh, in 2016 to the school board and 2018 to the city council. But before that, I really wasn't involved in any uh, civic issues. Then I find, so see, ever since I was elected, it has been my passion to get young people involved in civic issues. And through them, we get the community engaged, their parents and their friends. And I'm honored to work with them on many other events, and this is one of them. So let me introduce the moderator for this segment of the event, Maggie Dong. She is a junior at Branham High School. She is involved in several civic engagement projects, such as being the president of Young American Policy Advocates. That's an organization I founded. And she enjoys playing tennis and reading in her free time. I have worked with Maggie Dong for two or three years. And although she is a person of a few words, she gets things done. And <laughs> <laughs> so it has been a great honor to work with her. And I'll hand this out. Welcome. Thank you, Leo. OK, so before we begin, I just want to reiterate that the intent of this event is to foster a relationship between every candidate and the community, regardless of who gets elected. So every candidate should focus on policy issues and community, what the community cares about, and refrain from attacking other candidates. And the audience should keep an open mind while listening and refrain from campaigning for or against any other candidate during the event. Questions should be asked in a respectful manner, even though the content of the question might be pointed and challenging. Okay. I love it. <laughs> Before we begin, would you like to share a bit about yourself and your campaign? Sure. Well, thank you so much for joining me Sunday morning. Uh, thank you for standing here and, you know, sitting here for so long. I know I'm the last candidate to speak, but hopefully the best. You know, save the best for last. Um, my name's Daniel Chung. I'm a career prosecutor, uh, and I am committed to prosecuting crime, and that's why I'm running. I think that we have serious public safety issues here in Santa Clara County, including San Jose. Uh, I think both property crimes and violent crimes need to be prosecuted seriously. And there are serious problems, even with property crimes, that are being underreported and just not properly investigated. I know that with the high profile smash and grabs, we have certain prosecutions that are going on, but I meet small business owners every day and they are so fed up about how they have to keep replacing glass windows, how the police won't investigate, how the video surveillance is lost, how the DA's office won't cooperate or investigate or prosecute cases. So I wanna create a DA's office that's gonna be more responsive and make sure that we support law enforcement when they do the right thing, right? Obviously, when law enforcement engages in misconduct, we should hold them just as accountable as murderers, rapists, and other uh, criminals. However, when they do the right thing, we need to make sure that we prosecute those cases and we protect our communities. You know, I really also want to uh, restore integrity to our office. I think that there have been serious integrity failures over the last 12 years, and I want to make sure that we apologize to the community for mistakes that we've made and make sure that we do better, right? Because no, no person is perfect. I'm not going to be perfect if elected your district attorney, but I'm going to make sure that we work on things and we're transparent about things. And when we mess up, we take ownership for those things, are held accountable, and we improve our system. Um, I basically grew up in Milpitas. I've spent about two decades here in Santa Clara County. My mom was a single parent, basically, because my dad passed away when I was eight years old. So she and my maternal grandmother raised me here. Uh, I have a younger brother who's about four years younger as well. And I did a mix of public and private schools here. And I love the fact that high school students are out here getting engaged. I think I was probably playing computer games when I was in high school, not knowing who the DA candidates are. This is amazing. I mean, we have sophomore, junior, senior. They're way ahead of the curve, and they're going to be doing fantastic things. I hope one of you guys become the next DA in the future. 
Um, you know, I went to Harvard College and Columbia Law School on a lot of financial aid and student loans, some of which I'm still paying back. Uh, I'm a career prosecutor. I started in New York City, focusing on gun crimes there and did violent crimes here in Santa Clara County. And in 2020, I was awarded the Webb Award for being one of the two best trial prosecutors here in Santa Clara County. So that's enough about me. I wanna take your questions. I wanna be responsive to what your concerns are and uh, go at it. You know, you can attack me hard if you want. Uh, there's nothing I, I need to hide, so feel free. Perfect, and before we do that, I have but one more question. So last year, you wrote an op-ed about criminal justice reforms, especially about the then recent spike in hate against Asian Americans. And you mentioned not creating a revolving door for repeat offenders. And we were wondering if you could elaborate on that. Sure. Uh, so this was the article that kind of changed my life. Um, I actually published this Valentine's Day on 2021. So it's kind of a love letter that I wrote to the community, but it actually kind of backfired on me. So basically, in February 2021, uh, if you remember, this was before the Atlanta mass shootings that happened, where a bunch of spa workers were killed. And that sparked a whole corporate movement, an Asian American anti-violence movement after that. But in February 2021, basically there were just a few attacks going on, especially in San Francisco and Oakland, East Bay and SF. And obviously being in the South Bay and a violent crimes prosecutor, I was like, this is gonna come down to South Bay and we're gonna experience it. And we need to make sure that we're standing up for our community. You know, we're blessed to have an amazingly diverse community. And now I think according to the census, we're about 39, 40% Asian here. So obviously we care about what's happening to Asian Americans as well as everybody else in our community. But being an Asian American prosecutor, I really thought this is an issue that we need to speak out about. Um, we need to make sure that people are hearing us, that we are talking about this issue. We're taking the lead about it and people hear about the criminal justice reforms that are coming out. Because criminal justice reforms that around that time were coming out left and right, like several a week, and I couldn't even keep track of what was going on. And what I wanted with those reforms was, let's have balance. Reform is not a bad idea. Obviously there needs to be reform, but let's have balance so that we protect the victims as well as the defendants, right? and make sure that we hold people accountable if they engage in violent conduct. So that's why I wrote that article. It was an article, I, I wrote it in like less than two hours. Like one day I just like typed it out and sent it in, put a little disclaimer saying, this is my personal opinion only, not the views of my office, but things happened and uh, I'm here now running for Santa Clara County DA. And uh, I'm super grateful for all of you guys being here. Okay, and then last question. Some perpetrators of hate crime appear to be repeat offenders with mental issues. So what policies do you think could address such issues? So we need to take repeat offenders seriously because these... Sorry, let's move back a little bit because oh. people are in the sun right now. The oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please don't stand in the sun on my behalf. I, I don't want any sunburns today. Can you move one step forward? One yeah. step forward? Yeah, so, okay. so your face is yeah. nice. Yeah. I'm like learning to become like a TV news anchor. <laughs> Daniel Chung reporting for ABC or whatever. <laughs> um, so repeat offenders, we have to hold them accountable, okay? Like, I understand we need to give people second chances, even maybe third chances, because, you know, people come from all sorts of backgrounds and contexts. And, you know, people have individual choice, but their context and their environment shapes who they are and limits some of the choices that they have. So if we can give them second chances, if we can put them back on the right path, I think that's extraordinary. But if they don't take advantage of second, choice, second chances and just keep harming our community, we have to put our foot down. And that's why I think for repeat serious violent offenders, we should hold them accountable. And sometimes that might include prison. I'm the only one saying, sometimes we gotta send people to prison, right? Like this should not be a controversial thing. Rapists, these kinds of violent attackers belong in prison, right? We're not gonna just shake hands with them and be like, you know what, uh, you, can, you can try better, we're just gonna release you. 
right? No, absolutely not, right? There are certain types of crimes we cannot tolerate, and I think hate crimes we really need to be more vigilant about. Hate crimes are incredibly difficult to prosecute because you have to get inside the mind of the offender. You have to actually figure out their motive. And for most offenses, you don't actually need to figure out their motive. But for hate crimes, you do. So what we need to do for hate crimes is educate the public about how difficult these crimes are to prosecute and how we can gather evidence about these people to make sure that hate crimes are successful. Because the community hates it when they see these types of people get away with things, right? But there are things we can do to educate the public so that we gather the necessary information to succeed. Okay, thank you so much. So now we're gonna open up to public comments or questions. If anyone, yes. You mentioned Marcy Flo in your article. Uh, that was the first time in my 36 years. Uh, and since the uh, Proposition 9 passed that gave victims rights. Uh, so um, I, as a victim advocate, really appreciate that. And uh, I do want to get a sense of why you got in trouble for it. Because when I read it, I thought, wow, this is, um, the DA's office uh, preparing for re-election because it's that important. So I want to understand why, what, what exactly is the reason? So I, I don't want to attack uh, the current DA too much. I, I think I've spoken about it before and whatnot, but here, here's what I'll say about this matter. Um, when you're in power, you don't like other people speaking up, right? And especially if it's out of line or if, if they have not blessed your communication, right? And so if you speak truth to power, you better be ready for consequences, right? There will always be consequences if you speak truth to power. So, um, you know, I don't think when I wrote that article, I was thinking through all the different things that could possibly happen. I think I was really just passionate that why are all these reforms coming out that are so imbalanced? Why are Asian Americans experiencing so much violence and no one in the South Bay was speaking up? If you actually Google news results or op-eds during that time, I'm like the only article that came out in the South Bay advocating for Asian Americans and saying we need more balanced reforms. Jeff Rosen didn't write anything. Sajid Khan didn't write anything. I was the only one speaking up at that time. And that's why you know, I think things happened. But, you know, I'll stop it at that. I, I have my theories about why a lot of things happened, but it will require me to uh, criticize D.A. Rosen very Thank specifically. You. <laughs> <Go for it. laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Ted Scarlett. Um, based on the performance of the incumbent today, it seems to me that working at the D.A.'s office must be a very hostile environment. And what changes would you make when you become our next D.A.? So uh, one, we need to diversify the DA's office. I know that uh, there have been things uh, told today about how certain percentages are hired and whatnot, but the reality is the top of the office, the DA, his chief assistant, all of the assistant district attorneys, these are the ones who make the decisions, right? These are the ones who make big policies, supervise uh, hosts of teams, and basically approve things like whether someone goes away for life. This entire executive staff right now is white, entirely white, right? We need greater diversity in this office and we should not tolerate this lack of diversity at the top, right? And when we have hostile working environments, that's not acceptable, right? I've, I've brought this issue up in previous debates, but I can't think of a single supervisor who works in our office who hasn't paid into the current DA's campaign. These kinds of conflicts of interest can't occur, right? We need people to believe that if you work hard, if you do the right thing, whether you, you know, support the DA in his campaign or not, whether you go out and write an article on his behalf or not, you can still succeed and move up in the office, right? So I want to bring a little bit more of meritocracy back to the office and focus on just do your job, right? Your job is law enforcement. Your job is not politics. Right? Your job is law enforcement and focus on that. And I want to reward prosecutors in the office who are dedicated to serving the public. Yeah. Uh, I'm asking this question as a voter in my individual capacity. If elected DA, please can you share with us two reforms 
in current criminal in the current criminal justice system or criminal legal system, certainly not justice, uh, that you would pursue that impact both public safety, increasing public safety, as well ensure that we give people a chance to come back into our community rather than putting them in jail. Thank you. Yeah, and these are that's a great question. And these are two reforms that I've been talking about over and over again. One is changing the way we charge cases. The, our greatest power as prosecutors is charging because the police can arrest anybody they want. But if we do not charge an individual, nothing happens. They'll be released. So when we train our prosecutors, we need to calibrate them. There is zero training and standards when it comes to charging in the office. I know it's hard to believe because you're, you're just outside in the public, but I've gone through it. I came from New York City where we are trained hardcore in a live complaint room with supervisors and there's a lot of calibration that goes on. When you start at this DA's office, zero training zero training on charging. Can you believe that? Your most powerful tool, zero training. So we need to make sure that there is proper training and proper standards. It's not enough just to say, you know, was a crime committed? Who did it? You know, is there evidence? Is it the right thing to do? Everybody knows that. That's like textbook standards. We're talking about what evidence do you really need to gather, right? Let's figure out how do you prosecute these cases and make sure that we charge cases appropriately. In the current office, you hear things like, just charge the case to scare the guy. What? That's unethical. Just charge the case to get a plea bargain. That's absolutely unethical also, right? Those things have to change. So that's reform number one. Reform number two is we got to vertically integrate the office. Right now, the entire office is horizontal, assembly line format. So I'll charge a case, and then once I'm done charging, I'll give it to her and be like, you handle the next step of the case, and then she'll handle it, she'll uh, sort of throw it to another prosecutor who will handle another step of the, of the case. That's unacceptable. So over the lifespan of a case, which usually lasts about two to three years, seven to eight different prosecutors will be handling it. And when you're a victim, right, going back to Marcy's Law, Article 1, Section 28 of our Constitution, when you don't get speedy justice and you have no idea who's even handling your case, that's unacceptable. Right? So I really want to implement vertical prosecution in our office. That's the gold standard of prosecution because it, it requires one prosecutor to take ownership from the beginning to the end. So if you know that you're going to have to handle the case all the way to the end, you're going to make sure that you do a better job. And this way, not only are we protecting the public, but we're helping people reintegrate into our societies because we're going to improve the prosecutions that we do. We're going to make sure that only people who should be prosecuted are being prosecuted. And when we do prosecute them, we charge them appropriately, we sentence them appropriately, and we make sure that we move cases along in a speedy fashion. Ms. Moderator, may I have yeah. the pleasure of asking a follow-up, please? Yeah, of course. Thank you very much. Candidate Chung, my question was about legislation, not about human resource and changes in the DA's office. As you rightly said, you spend a lot of time talking about the current DA. As a voter, I want to know what changes will you bring legislatively that make our community more safe and also ensure that people who are forced to commit crimes are given a second chance because everybody in Santa Clara County cares about restorative justice, but also cares about our own public safety. So please elaborate on legislative changes, not human resource and training. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. S sorry, I misunderstood your question. I thought you were talking about reforms I'm bringing to the DA's office. So here's my answer to that question. I'm not a legislator. Right. And this is the clear distinguishing remark, distinguishing mark of me versus all of my other candidates. I am a law enforcer. The, the prosecutor, the DA of our county is not a lawmaker. And this is this is what I am so frustrated by. DAs come into office these days thinking I'm going to make law. I'm going to ignore law. No, you're not. You just took an oath saying you're going to enforce the laws of the state of California. Right. So enforce the laws. Am I going to support legislative reforms? Am I going to support advocacy? Am I going to support progressive causes? Absolutely. But that's not my sphere of power. It is inappropriate for me to be implementing my legislative agenda as the DA of this county. And that is something that I stick by. And that's what's going to dis distinguish me from my other candidates. I know a lot of them want to do other things. And I'm not saying those things are bad. I'm just saying we 
this is something we learn in civics, right? We have different branches of government. The legislative, government, the legislative branch of government is democratically elected and democratically passes laws. We live in a one-party state with the same party governor, same party assembly and senate. If they want to pass any reform, there is nothing preventing them from passing those reforms. And I welcome them to pass any reform that they want. And even if I disagree with it, I will enforce it. Spirit and letter. So if they want me to release whatever individuals, fine. I will publicly say I disapprove of this, but I will enforce it. Because my job is enforcing laws, not creating laws. I'd like to ask, if I may. Yeah, yeah go for it. Um, Marcy's law does require the district attorney to stand up for victims. Now, what are you going to do? And very specifically, it says, up and request by the victim, the DA must stand up. And I don't know of any case that ever the DA took to court on behalf of the victim's rights, including if the police departments are not doing what they're supposed to. How are you going to handle that? Yeah, so uh, here's the thing. One, uh, the DA technically does not represent victims. The, I know that we stand up and fight for victims, but we technically don't represent victims. What we represent is a sovereignty, the people of the state of California. So when we fight in court, we're not saying, you know, Daniel Chung for victim XYZ. It's actually Daniel Chung for the people of the state of California. So we represent the entire community, of which victims and defendants are definitely a part of. But unlike defense attorneys whose main goal is, I'm going to fight for my one client's interest and zealously advocate and get the best result possible, my job is very different. It can't just be, I'm just going to fight just for the victim and just make sure that the victim's interests are heard. I have to make sure that the whole community's interests are being protected. Now, what are steps I can do to help victims in our criminal justice system? For example, currently uh, under Penal Code 859B, we can have speedy preliminary hearings and make sure that felony cases are moving uh, uh, way faster. Under the current DA administration, they don't push for this. So what ends up happening is that defense attorneys will come to preliminary hearing and they'll say, we're waiving time. And so what that means is this case no longer has speedy trial urgency. And so these cases will linger for years, years and victims get tired, witnesses go missing, evidence goes missing, no one cares anymore. And so by the time the case resolves three or four years later, it's like no one cares. Oh yeah, probation, oh yeah, misdemeanor, dismiss, whatever, you can do whatever you want. Absolutely not under my administration. We're gonna move victims in this way because they deserve restitution. They deserve sentencing. They deserve truth also, right? And they're not gonna get that truth unless we are pushing cases forward. And I think that is actually also helping defendants. Defendants shouldn't have to wait in jail for years while we decide what's going on. That's not acceptable either, right? They have a presumption of innocence and sometimes we need to incarcerate them because of public safety reasons, but we should still be moving their cases forward. I wish we had 1,000 jury, uh, jury trial courtrooms available and 1,000 judges available every day and 1,000 prosecutors who could do it every single day. I want everybody to get jury trials. But unfortunately, we don't have that system. We unfortunately have maybe like six to 10 trial departments maximum, and we have tens of thousands of cases. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so, I have a question. Uh, apparently, there's been two grand jury investigations and that uh, the current administration has one of the longest prolonged uh, what do you call it, prosecutions of, of cases. Uh, could you speak to the, the cost associated with that? As you've already described the, the, the other matters and the uh, one prosecutor through the case idea is excellent because that prosecutor then owns it. If you have it going to several people, then nobody's responsible, nobody owns it. They can all point at each other when things go bad. But just speak to the part about the current situation, it must be costing the county a tremendous amount of money. It costs money, time, and people's lives, right? And the third thing is what I care about most, right? People's lives are at stake while we're delaying things, right? They are incarcerated, they're losing jobs, they're losing families, families are being broken up, 
right? They're losing opportunities. They can't go do things. Things are hanging over their head. There's no closure, right? People's lives are being interrupted and that's what I care about most. And that's why I want to speed things up. Yes, time, uh, money matter as well, but I actually care about people's lives more, right? Let's move people's lives forward, hold them accountable if necessary, but keep moving people forward, not backwards. Okay, yeah, go ahead. I'm sure our very bright school students understand you too. And the answer to my question, maybe it is also not within your sphere of power. I want to understand about the civil grand jury and what it does. Mm. Because I know that sometimes government departments make mistakes. And even if the civil grand jury has ruled that the government does make mistakes, nothing ever happens. So how, how to address that? In, in our universe, in how we understand things. Because I know for, su for sure that there is a certain government department in a certain city uh, in our area that has made mistakes and is still persecuting people. And there is, like on the website, the civil grand jury's rulings are already there. But that city department government is already, is still pursuing its own uh, punitive policies on the people. So unfortunately, civil grand juries are not within my power. I can't control what they do. However, criminal grand juries are. So what I can promise is if there needs to be investigations, if there needs to be uh, things looked at in terms of how public governments are working or public officials or you know even sensitive matters, I will use grand juries more. This county doesn't use grand juries enough. We should use grand juries, right? A lot of cases go through a process called preliminary hearing where just a judge decides things. But sometimes for particular types of cases, I think it makes sense to have the community look at the evidence and decide, should we issue charges against this person? And I think grand juries are a great tool. When I was in New York City, I was in the grand jury all the time, presenting cases, indicting cases, especially against gun criminals. So I think we should use uh, grand juries more, and I will use them more uh, if elected DA. I think most things will fall into either civil or criminal. If, if, if there's a particular thing that arises, bring it to my attention. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out a way to investigate it. Yeah. But it does concern, for example, the students of Berkeley. How, why is it that they're paying such high rent? Yeah. Because of the rent bill. Yeah, unfortunately, Berkeley is outside of our jurisdiction also. So even if I wanted to investigate that, that's not part of Santa Clara County. Not, not to investigate, but, but to see if there is recourse. Because bad things happen in life, and if we sit back and say nothing will ever happen, I don't think that it is a good attitude. And it's very difficult to get the attention of anybody who is trained in the law. And you are trained in the law. Yeah. Happy to have that longer conversation with you. I'll give you my card. You can email me. You know, I'm open to talking to all of you guys, whether you support me or not. Um, I, you know, if you want to flesh things out in greater detail, happy to talk. Thank you. Okay, great. So we are reaching the end of our event. So, Mr. Tone, do you have any conclusionary remarks? Do you have a question? Do you have a question? He has one more question. I would like to bring up an issue. Yeah. My twin brother was found poisoned to death here in Cupertino two years ago. He was found sitting upright on his sofa in front of a television, and uh, he was. Uh, the autopsy showed that he had poison in, in his body. The uh, no law enforcement has done any investigation. It's been ten years. I took it to Mr. Whittington uh, at the, at your office, and uh, all it was it was just just words and. No investigation whatsoever. Uh, what can I do? I've taken I've taken this to any law enforcement that I can, including the FBI, and to, to your office. Not a single investigation on, on his death. I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that. 
Um, right now, I can't do anything because I'm not in office. But if elected DA, bring it to me. We'll look at everything, right? Like, I know some things are not going to be credible. Other things are going to be credible. And we need to figure out what the truth is. But bring it to me. We, we'll look at it. May I bring it to you before election? I, you could, but I can't do anything. Yeah, I, I just don't have power. Get me elected, and then I will investigate anything and everything you want. Yeah. <laughs> OK, now we are reaching the end of our event. So Mr. Chong, do you have any conclusionary remarks? Sure, uh, I'll keep this short, because you guys have been standing here for so long. Thank you just so much for being here. I think participating in this democratic process is so important. And I think it's been unhealthy that no one has challenged the DA in the last 12 years. And I am the only prosecutor this year who's challenging him, right? And so I think people have very clear choices this year. If you like how things are going, if you like how crime is going in the county, right? If you think everything's fine, you feel safe, things have been improving, then give him another four years. Give the current DA another four years. If you truly believe that, I think you should vote for him, right? However, if you are not satisfied with the status quo, you have two radically different choices. One is a public defender who has never prosecuted a case in his life and is explicitly telling you that he is going to ignore the law on certain things and create his own law on other things. And then you have me, a career prosecutor, who is telling you explicitly, and the only one saying this, I am going to be tougher on crime. So thank you so much for your support. And you know, I'm really doing this because I believe in the people of our county and I think the office, the DA's office should be serving the people. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Chung. And thank you all for coming out today. Your willingness to be here shows your commitment to our democratic process. And do not forget to cast your vote on June 7th for whichever candidate you believe would be best fit for the job. Okay, thank you guys so much. Wow, amazing.